Um, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to this very uh, welcome initiative, and uh, I'd, I'd echo everything that Professor Tomato has said. I'm, I'm sure this will galvanise the kind of uh, momentum that I, I think is really building up around ocular melanoma research uh, and new treatments, and hopefully a, a bright future, certainly not in the too distant future. Um, as many of you will be aware, there's been a, a significant in, improvement in our understanding of cancer treatments, cancer biology in recent years, and many new treatments in many different cancers. And I think it's fair to say we've often lagged behind in melanoma, um, but only uh, this year, uh, you may be aware, there's been two new treatments licensed, which for the first time have shown very significant improvements in tumour shrinkage as well as an improvement in survival for some patients, which is the first time in decades. Now, one of the really important points from that understanding is doctors, researchers now recognize melanoma is not one disease. It's actually a number of different entities that behave differently and are gonna need new treatments. And that's created a real focus, particularly on the rarer subtypes, including ocular melanoma, which can only be a good thing for the future. So, what I'd like to do, if I can today, um, very much from an oncology perspective, is provide um, an overview, a summary um, of, of where I think we are in terms of ocular melanoma, particularly around the difficult issue of screening. Uh, some of the summary of, of what's out there on treatment of established secondary cancer in melanoma, and, and start to touch on some of the newer approaches that are evolving. Um, and some of the newer initiatives. And what, what I'll, I'll do, and I hope this isn't too dry, but I want to uh, very much carry on from where Professor D'Amato ended, is emphasised throughout, the only way to do this is, is through evidence base, proving our, our worth, and through constant collaboration. And that's collaboration amongst doctors, amongst hospitals, amongst countries, and particularly partnerships between patients and professionals. So, very welcome today. Um, just by uh, way of a little further introduction, um, I'm a medical oncologist, a chemotherapy doctor, um, and in Clashbridge up in Merseyside, and currently the lead on um, several UK trials where we've managed to establish for the first time, I'm sorry to say, um, it's taken a long time to get to the first portfolio of trials in the UK. Um, my work has, has kind of evolved very much from the support and expertise from working alongside Professor D'Amato in Liverpool. And for a long time, we've had quite a unique team, a unique collaboration, which I think is essential in taking forward treatment in other parts of the country. And that involves um, specialist pathology with Professor Copeland, some of the pathology work you've heard of, some of the tumour research, the work Professor D'Amato is involved with, close links with the liver surgeons, both in terms of clinical and research, and uh, interventional radiology, something you heard about this afternoon. But certainly key from my point of view as an oncologist has been the ability to collaborate with my fellow colleagues in oncology. And we now work through the National Melanoma Group, um, where we have a subgroup um, increasingly focusing on ocular melanoma as one of the rare subtypes. Um, we have a specialist unit in Liverpool now which is helping to drive forward some of the clinical trials that I, I'll touch on. And we have close links amongst all our oncology colleagues with European melanoma groups. And something I'll, I'll talk to at the end, a very exciting initiative where ocular melanoma has now been a focus of an international rare cancer initiative that's hopefully going to bring together researchers and uh, doctors from the US from UK and from uh, wider Europe, mainland Europe. Um, I think if there's one word that I come across more often than any other in ocular melanoma, it's the word rare. And uh, it's, it's been the obstacle to progress for a long, long time in this disease. Um, this um, illustrates the Cancer Research UK website incidence figures. And uh, as you can see, ocular melanoma is at the region of five to 600 cases per year, which is dwarfed by the number of breast cancer patients, which is edging towards 50,000 per year. And it, it's that that has enabled or has not enabled us to push forward with research in this rare area, although I'm hopeful that's changing. So regrettably, it has been a rare cancer site. It is distinct from skin melanoma, and we need to bear that in mind in future treatments, future research. 
An added challenge, certainly for oncologists, for follow-up for patients, is that the risk of relapse can be very, very long. It can extend beyond 10 to 15 years, and in some cases, up to 30 years, uh, illustrated cases of relapse have been uh, documented. The work Professor D'Amato has touched on is, is very important in focusing onto higher risk groups where we can focus down some of our more immediate research to try to prove its worth. There are several clinical hurdles we've got to get over if we want to create a standard of care. And perhaps the most obvious is, and, and as I'll perhaps show you, is we don't have a standard of care in terms of treatment that everybody can agree on. But Closely following that is, is a variability in the clinical management and particularly follow-up. And, and this is where the issue of liver screening is really central. What we've heard so far is at diagnosis, there's a great deal of specialisation in this rare disease um, with expert management. But there's then perhaps a less uh, agreed approach and a greater variability on follow-up and particularly liver screening. And often that's devolved because of convenience for patients. Uh, and what that leads to, it gives us a background of often late presentation where patients can present with quite large tumours with symptoms before we're aware and that can make treatment very difficult. Um, it's also led, I think, to a general lack of expertise amongst colleagues who see this as just another form of melanoma. And, and perhaps more than anything, that lack of standardisation in follow-up has created a lack of momentum in the past to create eye-specific research. Liver screening is, is terribly controversial. It's been debated um, since I became a consultant in 97 and probably a decade or so before that. The rationale is very simple. We have an illness, a disease with a very well-defined clinical course where the liver is often the first organ to be affected. So we know how this behaves. We have prognostication from what uh, you've heard earlier so we can focus on the groups where that risk is greatest. It, it makes sense if you can treat something early, you must improve outcomes. That seems intuitively correct and it offers the option of delivering treatment to prevent rather than to wait for recurrence. The problem is, whilst the rationale's straightforward, we don't really know which imaging to use, we don't know how often, we don't know how long. 15, 20 years of follow-up is perhaps difficult. And more importantly, we don't have any real outcome measures or a handle on cost effectiveness, something which is difficult to, to balance against individual patient needs. And, and this is summarised really in, in some of the evidence and only this year, uh, Dr. Augsburger from Cincinnati published some work on screening. And what he did is he reviewed all the literature on screening over 4, 000, on, on ocular melanoma, over 4,000 articles. Only 31 of those were actually suitable in terms of their design, their data, or their endpoints. 29 were case series. They weren't controlled in any way. They were a description of experience. They ranged from varying modalities of blood tests, chest X-rays, CT scans, MRIs. None of those trials were ever randomized. There was no control to show a benefit. <coughs> What they concluded was there is no evidence that screening for all patients will improve survival from the evidence. They did uh, raise the question that periodic surveillance for relapse should be questioned, but that there may be two exceptions. When this is part of an adjuvant trial, we're measuring what we're trying to achieve, or where screening facilitates future research. And, and I guess from my point of view, the issue we've got to to really um, face up to is, is what is the end point we're, we're aiming for? Is it survival? And we may not get there. Once we know the end point, we can decide on what the right modality is. Um, in Liverpool, we, we've taken a slightly different approach based on prognostication with the um, rationale. If we can focus on high-risk patients, we can not only understand the biology and the natural history sooner, 
but we can focus on those patients with the greatest potential need. And we're just completing what has been a 10-year prospective study, uh, non-randomised but um, informed consent study, in high-risk patients identified through the prognostic tools uh, you've heard of this morning. And that's involved six monthly liver MRI uh, with a number of blood tests. What's been important is that study has, has helped kickstart future studies and additional studies. And then alongside those, we've done important psychology sub-studies looking at the psychological burden of prognostication. And we're looking at prospective collection of blood samples to try and find new markers for the future. Uh, we're currently analysing our most recent update and uh, what we have is 188 patients, so it's relatively small numbers, although larger than most other series. A significant minority don't want screening for various reasons. Of, of the uh, 279, a number of patients due to travelling, due to comorbidity, did not take up the offer. Median time to relapse for this group of patients is 18 months, so it, it, the prognostication works. 92% of our patients are asymptomatic. The scan is the first in indication there's a problem. Nearly half of those had small tumours, and relatively small numbers of tumours, which suggested operability, the ability to remove them at surgery. But ultimately, following further investigations, most notably laparoscopy, a direct visualisation through a camera, only 11 of those patients had a complete resection, and I'll come back to that later. What we do know is if you can have your tumour resected, you will do better, and the survival uh, is double that of people who can't have surgery. What we don't know is whether we're really just selecting out better biology from people who have slower growing tumours. Um, and in this uh, cohort, over a third of people are well and stable for at least two years. What's been very important from my point of view and my oncology colleagues is that data threw up a real unmet need for treating people who don't uh, have operable disease. And that's through forward the first cohort of these studies, which have, I think, been a major step forward in terms of research. So from my perspective, there are lots of benefits. The majority of patients we see welcome standardised follow-up and welcome our six monthly visits. I've got no doubt this promotes standardisation of care and follow-up and expertise. I know much more now than I knew 10 years ago. It definitely identifies a small subset, probably 10% of patients who can have liver surgery. And more than anything, this standardisation will help us make progress and facilitate new research in the future. There's no doubt if we find asymptomatic tumours early, we have what we call lead time bias. That means people appear to be living longer because we find the tumour sooner, so it's not proof of benefit. I'm not sure whether this will improve survival for everybody, but it will certainly lead to improved research and the opportunity to develop preventative therapies. On the back of that, we don't know which modality. We don't know how often. We require a definitive trial, but we've attempted that and logistically it's proven to be very difficult on funding uh, arrangements, but it's something we need to keep, keep thinking about. Adjuvant treatment or the delivery of preventative treatment is intrinsically linked to uh, what I've discussed. And, and the biggest hindrance is we don't have a sufficiently active therapy that's proven to take into a preventative settings. We have some that aren't too far away, but we also need a large number of patients. We need coordination, we need collaboration to make that sort of trial work. There have been a number of trials which have attempted to do this. We've got some preliminary information. Um, a Swiss study um, looked at a group of patients and delivered intra-arterial chemotherapy, chemotherapy directly into the liver of people with no apparent cancer. There was significant toxicity from that approach and we have to be careful. Um, but their five-year survival was improved compared to historical controls. It, it's it's a, a, a message that there might be something, it's not proof. But it has led to the first ever randomised trial starting in France, uh, which is comparing people uh, with higher risk disease having intravenous chemotherapy or being monitored. 
that study is going to involve uh, around 300 patients. It's quite small, really. And in the UK, we're anxious to join in that study to give patients the opportunity. And uh, if we can climb through the hoops and uh, get over the bureaucracy of international collaboration. There are several small studies running across the US which are really very exploratory, looking at whether we can see safety with these treatments. But the biggest hurdle we face is the average benefit in most trials, in adjuvant trials, is only 10 to 15%. And for that sort of trial, you often need up to a thousand patients. And one of the pieces of work we're doing behind the scenes is working hard with our statisticians to develop newer randomised trials which will enable us to test this in smaller subsets of patients. Um, regrettably, despite all the good treatment on the primary, a significant proportion of patients do go on to develop secondary tumours. We don't really know, or I don't know, what the incidence is in the UK. I can only estimate it's in the region of 100 to 150 patients per year, but because of this devolved care, it's very difficult to know. We do know the liver is the most common organ affected, but with modern imaging, we're becoming more and more aware, actually, the tumour can affect other sites as well, and that may be important in the treatment we develop. The prognosis it can be very variable, and statistics don't tell us what an individual will do. And oncologists will tell you we have many, many good stories of patients who we think shouldn't be doing well. So we've got to remember we're dealing with statistics here. And a number of groups have tried to develop a prognostic scoring system for people with secondary tumours, similar to what you've heard. And a Finnish group have looked at their series. And, and it's just, I think, relevant to note that this specific subset of patients with small tumours who are well have a median survival of a year and a half, but that actually equates to at least a quarter of patients being well for up to two years or more. And that's irrespective of the modality of treatment they've had. And this prognostication is so important when we come to evaluate new treatments. There's no doubt surgery can offer uh, prolonged remission in some patients and probably cure for occasional patients. There's no trials. There's lots of anecdotes and there are a number of series which at least help us to make some conclusions about this. Um, I've discussed our experience in Liverpool of 90 relapses over that 10 years. 10% of patients had complete resection, which doubled survival. What many series don't tell you is what happens then. And in our hands, regrettably, nine of those 11 patients have gone on to develop further liver recurrence. And it's certainly in my mind very likely that from the outset we're dealing with a small multifocal problem that can't be necessarily fixed by just focusing on the, on the tumours we can see. We need other adjuvant therapies, we need other drugs. Very small series from Israel, um, 74 relapse patients over 19 years. It's not a lot of patients but with a 17% resection rate. And then the largest series in, in probably the world, I imagine, from the Curry Institute in Paris, where they looked at 470 patients over only an eight-year period. And they have remarkably consistent data, or I should say we have remarkably consistent data with them, with this 10% resection rate and a doubling of survival. So it does appear the figures uh, are similar across our centres. And I think we've come to several conclusions from those series and from our experience. No imaging is currently sensitive enough in this disease and many patients are upstaged when you have direct vision under laparoscopy and, and that's important when we optimise what type of screening we think is uh, uh, helpful, cost effective and safe. If you can achieve com complete resection it equates with long term survival and it's often in patients with one or two tumours and small volume disease regrettably further relapse is common so we need to look at other adjuvant treatments. Unfortunately most patients are not eligible for operable for resectable, resectable surgery and historically the benchmark of treatment has been chemotherapy and I just put this table up it's a bit busy but I think it illustrates some of the challenges we have in moving forward. Um, this is a series of studies that often come from single institutions, that they, that therefore to some extent possibly biased by selection. 
None of these studies are controlled. There's, there's no kind of way of uh, comparing outcomes. The vast majority are very small numbers of patients, and this stretches over 10 to 20 years of research. Various types of chemotherapy, but there's a consistency that chemotherapy is not very good. The response rate to chemotherapy, the ability to shrink tumours, is actually very small. However, there are cases in all series of patients who have disease stabilization. And what this data doesn't tell us is what the duration of that stabilization is, which is something we need to know for the future. The overall outcome from these studies is poor, but again, it often reflects uh, research 10, 20 years ago treating patients with very advanced disease. We've now uh, moved on in our kind of first phase of new trials, I guess, uh, away from chemotherapy and the real focus in many cancers now is towards targeted therapies which are much more focused on the biology of the disease and uh, in recent years there's been an emphasis on a specific gene that can go wrong in some melanomas called the KIT gene and it's been known for some time now that in some rare melanomas that can drive growth of the tumour and on the back of that research we've now had three studies completed in ocular melanoma across the world, in, including a UK study which completed last year. Unfortunately, those studies are, are largely negative um, in terms of the overall survival outcomes. However, th there are a number of positives to come from this. These studies are accrued quickly. The UK study accrued within 18 months, much quicker than old studies. There's a momentum building. Um, whilst there were no major responses, there are actually two responders in, in our series in the UK and a number of patients with more prolonged disease, including a patient who's still on therapy 18 months on. We don't know if that's the imatinib or as with all series, there are some patients always doing better. Similar study in the US using a related drug called sunitinib first reported a few years ago um, and that a further response, but again, a hint that disease stabilisation, putting the brakes on, was maybe a more realistic outcome. What we've since found from these studies and from other studies is there are very rare kit mutations in the eye melanoma, but it means we can close the book, we can move on to the next treatment. And following very closely on this has been a, another um, move forward with an identif identification of another genetic abnormality which may be much more specific. More than 80% of tumours have this and there's now a race on to try to develop drugs that can target this specific problem. On the back of that data um, it's created a momentum and you may be aware in the UK we're now currently running one of the studies that are ongoing, the SWAV study. And this study is trying to evaluate sunitinib in a more methodical way. We know sunitinib may not have a high response rate, but it may be sufficient to shift stabilisation. And this study um, is one of the largest studies in the world at only 120 patients. We're a third of the way along the way. Um, it's based upon the pilot study which suggested stabilisation, but it, it's essential if we're going to move away from chemotherapy that we prove this in a randomised trial. It's something I'll come back to, but because of that, the design is that patients who receive chemotherapy can cross over at an early time point to allow the maximum exposure to sunitinib. Another important aspect of that study, again linking on to what was discussed this, uh, earlier, is we're collecting tumour biopsy material from every patient and blood samples to help us find a new way, new targets. So that part is essential as well. Perhaps the most exciting thing about this on another very busy uh, slide is we've gone from very few studies, very often case series, to a mini explosion of research in ocular melanoma. And this table highlights just a number of trials going on across the US and Europe each of them are looking at different drugs. Many still only have a number. They're looking at different aspects of the disease. The majority are single arm, but at least one large study, the other large study in, in the US, is looking at an approach which involves randomizing against chemotherapy with crossover for the same reason. So, so there's, there's a momentum building up about research. I just want to say a very brief word about ipilimumab. I know Christian's gonna speak much more about this. 
And you may be aware that this uh, drug has recently been licensed in skin melanoma following reports from two studies which have reported survival advantage for the first time ever in skin melanoma. Um, there are toxicity issues that are being overcome, we have to be aware of, but, but I really just wanted to make two points. The first point is that Bristol-Myers, the company that read the, uh, run this study, specifically excluded eye melanoma patients from the study, believing they have a different disease process. So the data does not tell us about eye melanoma and we have to be wary of that. We have attempted from the outset to set up a trial of ipilimumab, but for the reasons you've heard already, it's not sexy, it doesn't make money, and it's been a struggle. But I'm pleased to say I'm now aware of at least two studies in Europe evaluating ipilimumab in Barcelona and in Essen, which are single-arm studies, but will give us some prospective data to get a handle on this drug. A very brief word on, on randomization and control arms, something that I think patients and professionals find very, very difficult. One of the problems we've had in the past, and we've got 20 years of failed research, is that single arm studies where people receive one active drug, one experimental drug, can give us a signal. They can say something might be happening, but they don't prove benefit. They don't tell us people live longer or live better. We're also aware that cancer patients survive longer with every decade. That's partly because we pick things up early, lead time bias I've spoken about, but it's because awareness and supportive care is getting better all the time. So survival from a trial today can't be compared with survival from a trial 10 years ago. And we're also aware there's bias in publication and eligibility. Studies will recruit specific patients who may actually do better and uh, publications may actually only report positive results. So there's a lot of bias in this we've got to be very aware of. And because of that, despite a rare cancer, we have to build in some form of randomization to move forward um, and, and do away with chemotherapy. And the way we're trying to do that is by building early uh, assessors of response and allow crossover as quickly as possible. Just very quickly, that the uh, alternative approach, um, given the biology of this disease and the natural history to affect the liver, is to direct treatments to the liver. And in very similar ways to systemic chemotherapy, there have been a large number of series uh, with the same problems, really, delivering chemotherapy into the liver. These studies, by and large, are single arm, they're small, they use various chemotherapy. What's consistent from these is the chance of shrinking the tumour is much higher, and it's consistently 30 to 40 per cent. What's less consistent is what does that mean in terms of survival, and the data is quite variable. And there's only been one randomised trial, there's actually two I'll mention in a second, which has tried to unpick this, and a recent large European study from the European Melanoma Group has randomised patients to re receive chemotherapy via the vein or directly into the liver. That study has taken six years to reach 169 patients and has had to close um, because it's deemed not possible to recruit the, the final end. The results are not available yet, but one of the reasons for closure was something called futility which actually suggests even if you recruit more patients, you're unlikely to find a difference in these two arms. So whilst the phase two data tells us you can shrink tumours quicker, the phase three data doesn't say it will make you live better or live longer. Some of the chemotherapy data is, is moving on now, and there's a number of newer treatments which you'll hear much more about this afternoon. And I just want to mention two again very briefly here. Um, one of them, Sursphere, is delivering local radiotherapy to the liver. Uh, the second is drug eluting beads, putting chemotherapy around uh, beads into the liver. The general comment I wanted to make is, is we've got the same issue here that we need to get, get, get beyond, which is we have a lot of research evidence in other cancers. We have very large phase three trials going on but we have only really small amount of experience in eye melanoma specifically. And, and in this one particular report, uh, which was the last one I found, it suggested surspheres may have a real benefit on stabilization, 
but we just don't know what that means. We need to do more prospective work to understand it. Similarly, drug eluting beads, in this small study, 100% of patients responded, but two years on, we've not heard any more about longevity of benefit. We don't know what it means. The most robust data at the moment that exists for regional therapy comes from a treatment called isolated liver perfusion, you may have heard of, the Delcath system. In this technique, very high doses of chemotherapy are perfused into the liver by effectively locking the chemotherapy into the liver by a system of catheters and balloons which prevents leakage into the circulation. Um, it's a uh, procedure that used to involve a major operation but can now be done in the x-ray department using uh, percutaneous needles. This is not a straightforward treatment, but for the first time what these researchers have done is they've tried to give some methodical approach to this. And this year, um, the investigators from Pittsburgh reported this study of 90 patients. It's not a large number of patients, but it's a randomized trial in which patients received intrahepatic chemotherapy or received best available care, which was frequently systemic chemotherapy. Consistent with the previous results, 30% response rate, 30% of tumours shrunk. And in this study, the disease stabilisation, the progression-free period, went from 1.6 months to 8 months. Quite a dramatic stabilisation. What the study didn't go on to show was that made people live longer, though. So we've got the same problem. So just to conclude briefly... We know regional therapy has a higher response rate than systemic chemotherapy. We know there are a lot more toxicity issues with catheters. We have to be careful. And we know the majority of data comes from single arm small studies. We have two randomized trials now. Both have not yet shown a survival advantage by delivering treatment to the liver. So we don't know yet what effect this has on quality of life. I want to just end on, on a high note and one thing I mentioned at the beginning was a real momentum happening around ocular melanoma. And uh, in recent months, there's been uh, an agreement that ocular melanoma should represent one of the cancers put forward for support from what's called the International Rare Cancers Initiative. This is a new initiative that brings together the US researchers, UK researchers and mainland uh, Europe researchers with an aim to deliver trials much quicker, much better in rarer cancers. And we've had a number of teleconferences and the first formal meeting happened in Stockholm this weekend where there's the very first steps of agreement of a, a trial design across the world that will involve a concurrent approach in large numbers of patients across the world, which will allow us to test multiple drugs which are coming through much more quickly, improve access to trials, reduce time, reduce costs and bureaucracy, and develop a much more centralised approach to translational research. That initiative is a little way off, but we've got some good evidence, a good precedence already in, in the world, and particularly in this country. Another rare cancer, that of childhood cancers. 1,500 cases per year, double that of ocular melanoma. But over the years, with a coordinated and collaborative approach to trials, the paediatric cancer network has delivered dramatic improvements in survival year on year with over 50% of children now treated in trials. So briefly to summarise, ocular melanoma is distinct from skin melanoma. We must keep remembering that. Progress has been hampered by lack of coordination in the past. It's getting a lot better. There is a role of screening in my mind for high-risk patients. It facilitates research at the very least, but we really don't know the optimum approach. Standardisation in the UK will help drive the momentum I've discussed, though. 10% of patients can be resected if found on the screening programme and may have a better outcome. There is no standard of care, I'm afraid to say, which is where we're trying to get to but the International Rare Cancer Initiative will help us get there faster. Further progress will need strong patient involvement, and I'm very much welcome today for that reason. Thank you.
I've never asked any of my parishioners to cure me. Mm-hmm. I've just asked them if they can't cure me, to give me a better time, or a slightly longer time, I'd like. Mm-hmm. And I don't see that evidence-based medicine actually thinks about the quality. They're looking at overall survival. And um, not true. I, th- I think in assessing benefit, the first is, does it shrink? The second is, do you slow it down? The next is, do you live longer? And, and as part of the live longer, quality of if life measurements are, are intrinsic to what we do and what we would want to do. Um, so I, 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 I'm only going to live six months, then I want those six months to be an extra six months. Yeah, and, and, and one could argue, therefore, don't have treatment. So that's the awful balance. Having treatment may tie you up in hospital. It, it may cause all sorts of problems. That's the counter argument that in trying to deliver the right treatment, we, we all want people to live better, live longer. But, but I, I sense we will we'll never get there if we carry on constantly anecdoting. We, we have to find a way to do this that helps everybody. But I do That's believe. I, I do, but I, I, think, I think I can only... No, 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 and, and I think you have to be selfish. But I think as a doctor, I want to say in 10 years' time, we've made progress. And an individualised approach, I don't think we'll do that. But, but in your shoes, I, I think I, I, I can agree with everything. I, I would say, f- even from skin melanoma, the response rate to one of the new drugs was 50%. You know, it's dramatic. Mm. Even that needed... A randomized trial it, it happened very quickly and consequently the world's moving on but to commission treatments to to get standardization we've got to deliver evidence yeah but in a very small instance of disease skin melanoma a much bigger instance yeah yeah but anecdotal yeah I agree. Anecdotal signposts take us that direction, but I, I think you, you and many people have helped us get there. But with the things I've talked about, I think we've got a global population now. We can do this. We just need bigger numbers across the world rather than in Liverpool, Glasgow, whatever. It, it's about collaboration, this, and we can do it if we do it together. I think certainly in the past, if, if a patient's found to have a large amount of tumour and um, the options for treatment are slim, th- there is a question as to whether an invasive procedure, a biopsy, is fair and appropriate. And, and there's certainly patients where we won't necessarily request or demand a biopsy in the setting of a high-risk patient where there is a, a large form of disease where we can't manage it. Where we're certainly edging towards treatment, most oncologists would wish histological confirmation so we're not missing something else as well, as well as part of the research is enabling us to actually develop new ideas from that tissue as well. So I, I don't think all oncologists would say it's, it's not absolutely necessary in all cases. I think you have to make an individualised decision there on, on the benefit and risk. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I think the other thing, just so don't confuse, biopsies don't need laparoscopy. The, the telescope is a way of evaluating the liver for resection where images don't tell us all the answers. Can I just make a comment as well? So I'm not going to just go down to um, Biopsies aren't a panacea either, unfortunately. Sometimes we don't get diagnostic results and they take time. It might take a week or two to organise one, a week or two to get a result. That's four weeks. And if you've got a negative biopsy after four weeks, especially in someone being ill, when things are moving rapidly, Thank you.